as Juan said, I'm Cristian Alcaroli, I'm a software engineer at Intuit, and I'm going to talk you through modern full stack in Scala. So recently I've been working with uh, front-end technologies and I saw that there is a very, a very wide number of technologies that you can use. And, but I'm a, a Scala developer, let's say, in my heart. Right now I'm working also with Java, uh, Ruby. But I said, oh, why, why not to create a pipeline all with uh, Scala? To use Scala.js, GraphQL, and Scala also in the backend. And what this talk is about is a seed project that I've created that everybody can uh, fork on GitHub and you can start writing Scala straight away. So the reasons are because I love Scala as a static type language and apparently also Airbnb realized that you get, up, they got about 38% less bug in their code when they moved to uh, TypeScript, that is a type language. And I said, why not doing the same thing, but with Scala? And the other, the other reason is because I know Scala better, so it improves my, my productivity. Because I know the API, I know how to use the collection. And also, I want to leverage all the new technologies that come out in the, in the front-end development, which are uh, React, which is uh, uh, all the component that comes with React. I do, I'm a lazy soft uh, developer, and I don't want to rewrite the code every time. So I'm going to show you very briefly a dummy project that I created with, uh, with the seed project that I, I made. And it's basically just a, a page that has a, is completely done with React, but written in Scala. It has a small menu that shifts between two pages. This is a single page application, so there is no uh, request made to the server. And here, I, I have just a product list. I can add a new product. If I do a mistake here, I put a number, I get the validation. You see the fading of the validation. I didn't write that because I'm lazy. I got it already made. And uh, I do my description here. And when I add it, there's something new there. I, don't, I didn't want to add the photo to not overload the, the program. I, I just got a default photo there just to show the concepts, OK? So this is the, the thing I'm going to talk through, the whole, uh, the whole speed. Uh, going back to the slides. What I've used, I've used Slinky. That is, uh, basically, is the Scala porting of React. It's a library made with macro that allows to write components very similarly to where, where how you write them in React. I have AntD, which is a library of React component that is the same that Alibaba and Baidu use. It's the second most widely used one. The first one is Material, Material UI, which is the Google one. Apollo client to make requests to the server and also to alter the state of the uh, client. Sangria, that is the engine of GraphQL in the server side. Then I have Play, that is, uh, gives me the, the server side part. It, it also helps me with the uh, library load. It gives a nice tool to deploy, deploy production development, so I don't need to do those things as well. And the project structure is very simple. You have a web client, which is the Scala.js part. You have a server, which is the uh, Play framework. Then you have a shared uh, project, that is the code that you want to run both in the server and in the client. So you can share, right? With Scala, you write it once, and you can, for example, validation can be used both in, in the front end and in the back end. The back -end. And schema, which is the module that contains the GraphQL schema. How this is built, first you compile the server, then with the GraphQL schema, you generate the SDL, which is the language that the GraphQL uh, understands, let's say. Then what you do with that, you use that schema to validate the query on the client side. We're going to see more of this later on. But basically, what we want is to have a type safe query. So we define the query with the SDL uh, language. We compile them, and they give us case class that we can use in the, in the front end. Then we compile the front end code, and we pack everything with Webpack to be able to deliver it to the front end. 
Okay, so how, how we do this? Sling uh, give us this uh, uh, macro that is React that you can see top left here that allows you to define a, a component that is which is very similar to how, how you define it in React if you have ever done that. And you can define props which are configuration for the component. If you never work with the React, a component is like a glorified HTML tag that can have a state that you put in the page. And for example, in, in the example that I showed you before, the whole part we're showing the product is a component, the framework, the form is another component, okay? The menu is another component, so it's a like glorified HTML tag. And, and then you have the render function, which is the part that actually renders what is the content of the component. In this case, all these components that you see, the row, the call, the layout content, those are uh, apporting from the AntD library. So I just brought interfaces to the AntD library and I used that, the, which is written in JavaScript. So in this case, the layout content, com, uh, content gives just structure to the content. Product display is another uh, component that I brought, which is the part the, showing the products. HR is a common uh, HTML tag that is a horizontal row. And then I create a row, which, which, is, which has a column inside, and the, the form. Okay, that I, this, this syntax comes from the ant uh, library. Here instead is how I define a mapper to the ant library. So what I do here, I say, okay, in the ant library there is an object which is input, that is the in input box, and I'm declaring it as native, and I declare that it has to pick it up from ant the library. At this point, I just need to define this other component that is an external component here, and I'm defining which properties they defined in the library, so that I can, when I call the component, I can specify, oh, I want, it, I want this to be disabled, I want a default value, or something like that, okay? So this is what I can do in the front end. I mean, these components, I can just uh, use them together to make up the front end that you should be, we've seen before. In the, in the back end, instead, I want to define my GraphQL schema, and this is the syntax that you use in the, uh, with Sangria. Okay, so the first three lines, you just define a, in this case, you just define a, an interface with a field that is ID, so it is an identifiable interface. Then we have a picture that is derived from a case class picture. We derive the object so we don't need to write anything, we just add some documentation here. And then we have the product that is also derived by the by a case class. But we say, look, this product actually implements the interfaces, so we're gonna have an ID. And we also want to create a relationship between the product and the pictures. And we say, uh, look, a product has pictures and you also will be able to define an argument for the picture that, for example, is the size in case you want to do filtering or pagination or something like that. Resolve is just the, the resolver that's going to retrieve the picture either from the database or whatever you're going to store. So that piece of code, when it goes through the, the step of compilation that generates the SDL, creates this SDL. And we can use this afterwards to validate that our queries are, are, uh, good, are, are well, well uh, written for our uh, backend. Now, we're not done with the backend because we also want to define which query we want to run on, on it, right? We can either, with GraphQL, you can either just extract, uh, uh, extract types, okay? You say, I want all the products. But if you want more precise queries, you need to define which queries you want to run. In this case, we say, okay, give me all the products. This is, of course, is a dummy example, but you say, give me all the products, and it will return a list of products, okay? This code, when compiled, generates a list of queries. In this case, it's just one, but here is the name of the query, and here is the return type. So we'll see later how we can use this in the front end to actually query the backend. So, moving to the front end, uh, when, when we use, uh, when we want to make a query to the backend, we can use the old way, which is just sending rest, 
code, but it's not very React, uh, uh, let's say, React compliant or React uh, doesn't leverage all the powerful uh, tools that React gives you. What we can use, we can use Apollo client, which has been developed uh, on purpose to work with the GraphQL. And uh, uh, Apollo client can work in two ways. One is uh, using the query as it is written on the left. Okay, so we just send in the query, but we as a Scala developer want to have the result with the types. So that is not very effective because then we need to browse the whole result type uh, manually. So what we do, we actually write this query into a separate file that the compilation will parse, validate against our schema, and generates types for it. So when we have those types, we can use them using this query component that is um, mapping to the Apollo client that basically what it gives us is uh, it says uh, wherever I put this component into my uh, front end retrieve the data that I'm asking you to retrieve with my typed query here and produce the output that I'm gonna write inside the higher order function that is inside. So I'm going to get a result and I say if the result is still loading, just write a h1 tag, okay? If it's a, an error, write h1 again with the error. Otherwise, what I want is I want a row that contains all the columns of my product. And how I do it? I just get the data from the result. The data can be optional, but in this case I know that it's not optional because it's a dummy example. And uh, I say, okay, give me all the products and map it to, a, to columns. And in each column, you put a card, which is the, the thing that you saw in, in the presentation. And that card is also developed by Anti, so I, I haven't done anything there as well. So here, I'm just mapping it, and in that function, the render product card, what I do is I actually deal with the product, which is basically case classes. For example, in this image, I'm just saying, get the product, get the picture from the product, take the first one, take the URL, if it's not there, just use a default one, which is the old that you saw before. Uh, and here in the card meter, which is the lower part, the white one, I'm just like, take a product name, take the product description, and put it there. So this is the read part, okay? Then what you want to have, you also need to have a write part, which is the dual of the query that is called mutation in Apollo client, and also in the GraphQL environment in general. So what I want here is this component is a mutation. Wherever I put this component, uh, use this mutation that I've defined like before. Okay, so I have a separate file, and I'm like. Here is the mutation, compile it, give me the types as we did before with the query. I'm saying run, this is the mutation that I want to run and use this update strategy. What this is, is when I change with a mutation the data in the, in the server, I want all the other queries that refers to that data to be updated. And so in this case, I'm, I'm saying the, the query all products, which is the one that we saw just before, I want it to be updated. In this way, when the mutation gets triggered, the Apollo client takes care of refreshing all the other queries. Okay? And what this uh, component gives you is an add product function that you can call within your uh, uh, component. And when you call that, the call is actually made to the server. This is just syntax from the Andy library, I'm just creating a form which on submit uh, uh, sends the this add product to a separate method that is going to call it. Uh, you saw also the validation on the, on the example and the validation is very easy. I didn't have to write any code for that, I just said this field is required, write this message, if it's uh, wrong, use this regular expression to check if, the, if there is any number inside the, inside the string, okay? So that's completely automatic and com it comes completely from the, from the library. So I, in this whole project, I actually wrote very few lines of code because most of it was already done. 
and that's how I boost my productivity, not doing, not doing it. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, let's do the other question. Just quick one. Yeah. Is this React part of the the system or? So this is these are all React components, the form item. So basically, this thing goes inside the uh, uh, render method. Okay. Okay. So. It, so this is wrapped by the, the render method. I didn't put the whole component because of uh, matter of space, okay? But the mutation is basically inside the React component. You can imagine it as a ta HTML tag, okay? In the render, I put the mutation, and that will be, when that will be rendered, will show these things, okay? And when I press some submit, it's gonna trigger this, which will send actually the mutation. Okay. And uh, so th this is basically how you build the form using entity, using this uh, mapping done for entity. And, uh, and this is basically most of the code that I wrote for, the, for this component. You can, you can check it out yourself, but it's, it's very few lines of code. And uh, the, the Apollo client is very powerful because it has a cache that it holds inside. And basically, uh, when you send when you send request, the the cache get popul gets populated for you, and when you send mutation, this uh, the Apollo client realizes automatically that things are things change. So if you, for example, change uh, one one product, let's say, which has an ID, the cache automatically understand and automatically refresh all the rest. So you don't have to... Is that server-side cache or client-side cache? No, client-side cache. The Apollo client is stays in the... It's like a React part. So it stays in the client-side. Has it got listeners to if other people have changed products? No, it's, not, it's only within your session. Right. It's not... A, okay. for, for that, GraphQL needs to have a subscription. And then it, that's a different thing, but you can handle that as well. And so, for this seed project that I've created to start straight away, next step that I have to do to improve is improve the building time. At the moment, is between 10 to 20 seconds. Let's say when you make a front end change and you refresh before you see the, the changes. But I'm not using Webpack that server, which is uh, something that does the incremental compilation. So if you make a small change, it just compiles that bit and shows it immediately and also automatically refreshes the page. And that gives a huge boost in performance when you actually deal with the front end. Uh, I, didn't write, I didn't write the test framework yet for the front end. I didn't set it up, which because it needs a, a browserless rendering of React. This already exists. It's just a matter of time to implement it. And also, Apollo client. Uh, what I'm using, which is the uh, updates, update strategy with the uh, refetch, is, is not the optimal one that you can have because there is another way that uh, the mapping, the, Java, the Scala JS mapping doesn't have yet, but the, the JavaScript one has. That is, you go in the cache and you change yourself what you know you changed. In that way, all the rest of the uh, query gets updated without actually sending any request to the server. So, I just encourage you to fork that or clone it and uh, test it on your laptop. This is, takes, uh, is very rapid to test it. You have a readme at the beginning that tells you the two or three things that you need to do before running it. And then you can just do SBT run, run a, a play framework, and it gets populated. So you see how all these bits that I showed you are connected together.